Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 197 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Gregory Pence. He teaches bioethics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and he's also the author of the book Who's Afraid of Human Cloning? In 2000, he was the only bioethicist to testify before Congress against a bill that would have criminalized human cloning. He's also written over 60 op-eds, which have appeared in places like The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and Newsweek. And his new book is called What We Talk About When We Talk About Clone Club, Bioethics and Philosophy in Orphan Black. And this will involve spoilers for season three of Orphan Black, so just be aware of that. And now here's our interview with Gregory Pence. All right, so we're here with Gregory Pence. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, so first of all, just tell us about how you got interested in bioethics. Oh, that's a good question. So uh, it was 1975, and uh, I needed a job in philosophy, and I was uh, teaching up in New York City, and uh, a job became available in Birmingham, Alabama, but it wasn't a permanent job. But the Karen Quinlan case occurred up in uh, New Jersey, where she was in a coma, but probably never going to come out. And the medical dean said, uh, I think we need to create a new position in, you know, in bioethics to teach medical students about these issues. And if you, maybe you should apply for it. And uh, at the time, I uh, actually was a little reluctant to apply for it because I wanted a nice, safe job in philosophy. But uh, I went for it and... Uh, I didn't know that I was probably getting into the one of the most exciting fields in academia. <laughs> well, yeah, like I heard you say that you, you were around when the IVF uh, controversy came about. Yeah, in fact, that was three years later. And uh, looking back, it's kind of amazing that uh, how crazy people were. You know, people thought, I mean, they literally thought that, you know, you were pouring chemicals in a test tube and something like the monster from Gremlins was going to come out. <laughs> You know, because, you know, words like test tube baby are very powerful. And um, there was actually an editor of Science Magazine at the time who wrote an editorial, which I have a copy of, that said test tube babies create issues as big as nuclear bombs, <laughs> which is crazy. Just crazy. Yeah, I mean, like you say in the book that uh, James Watson, who uh, won a Nobel Prize, was even one of these people. He was. At Max Perutz, uh, he he now regrets what he said, uh, but yeah, people were just completely insane about you know just briefly taking egg and sperm outside the you know the sanctity of the womb and what that might mean. They they really didn't understand it. Uh, and what what happened is Louise Brown was born in '78, and people ran from the mother when she pushed her baby carriage down the street. But once they saw <laughs> it was a normal-looking baby, everything went away. <laughs> it sort of makes you wonder if, uh, when cesarean sections started, if people had that same sort of reaction. Probably. Uh, the uh, there is a famous doctor, J. Marion Sims, who invented the speculum and tried to help people have uh, children by using a uh, a turkey baster to inject sperm from uh, in, in, uh, infertile couples. And he was really criticized, you know, for doing this, which is, again, amazing because we're talking about a married couple who wanted to have a baby. It's, it's, in some ways, it's very pro-life. But, you know, anything different, you know, makes, you know, when it comes to babies and sex and reproduction, you know, people uh, very easily manipulated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so so tell us what happened when uh, Dolly the Sheep was cloned in 1997. So some of the exact same people, like Leon Cass and Dan Callahan, uh, who had criticized IVF, were right out of the gate criticizing cloning. And uh, I said to myself, you know, I've seen this before, and I don't trust these people. <laughs> and uh, to me... You know, the words are really important. If you talk about an army of escape, escaping clones, that has one connotation. If you talk about a delayed twin, that has a different connotation. So I think that you should never take a tool off the table. You never know when you might need the tool. Uh, I actually got involved testifying before Congress 
at one point in 2000 because Congress wanted to make all forms of cloning, even embryonic cloning, a federal crime. And I thought this would be a huge mistake, as it would have been, to uh, make especially embryonic cloning a crime. But we came really close. Sam, Sam Brownback, now governor of Kansas, was kind of leading uh, this movement, something called the Brownback Bill. And, uh, you know, it's it's bad to make this kind of legislation when you're really emotional and you've been manipulated because uh, you, you never know when you're going to need the tools. Well, I mean, so what was that like testifying before Congress just as an experience? What was it like? It was like being in Brazil at Carnival. <laughs> I mean, it was complete. I mean, in some ways, it was a completely orchestrated joke because they purposely invited Rael and the Raelians, and he was there with his top knot and his silk ro- ro- you know, robes. And it was like the Watergate hearings. There were like hundreds of cameras, and it was C-SPAN was doing it, you know, live. And but it was all just to kind of show uh, the, 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 you know, they had no no intention of really listening to anybody seriously, but they gave them all a chance to be on TV a lot. And that's what congressmen really want. <laughs> Well, and so this guy, Rael, for people who may not know, was a, sort of a religious cultist, kind of, who had falsely claimed to have cloned a human baby. Yes, he was a French race car driver who was kind of like Charlie Manson, who uh, kind of invented a cult. He liked to exercise in the nude with his female followers and uh, claimed that, you know, from he was going to, he had, he had and would clone a baby, and he had a drop box, a mailbox in the Cayman Islands where people could send him deposits, you know, and he got several hundred thousand dollars of money. And of course, he never had any chance or way of cloning a baby, but he manipulated people pretty, pretty easily. Yeah. I mean, did you interact with him at all? Like, what was he like? I sat as far away from him (laughs) (laughs) because I thought he was just a complete, there there were a bunch of people that were complete sleeves. There was a guy named Pavarotti Zak. Zavos, who was a, he got a PhD in turkey sperm, and he thought he claimed that he was going to clone somebody. And there was a Chicago physicist, and I kid you not, his name was Dick Seed, who <laughs> he said he was going to clone himself. But they were all just grabbing media attention, and and the media bit. It was amazing. It was it was kind of crazy time. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, I remember when that happened, and I, how I just thought there was such a overreaction given exactly what the technology was. Um, it was a tremendous, but the the C word kind of like paralyzes thought. And uh, it's uh, it was certainly the biggest explosion in bioethics in my lifetime, which is in bioethics, which is over 40 years. Uh, it, it just like people kind of went temporarily crazy for a while. You know, it was really, that's one of the reasons I, I like the show Orphan Black is that it portrays people who have been originated by cloning as completely normal for the most part. Right. Well, let's, I guess let's talk about the show. I mean, what, what was it that motivated you to want to write a book about Orphan Black? Well, my wife's a clinical psychologist, and she had written uh, an article on a book, Harry Potter and Psychology. And she said, you know, you wrote all this stuff on cloning, and Orphan Black is about cloning. And it's a natural fit. You ought to do a book on cloning. And most of the books that are published this way are like anthologies. And uh, I had an experience with anthologies. And they're hard to put together because people promise you something and they don't do it. But I had been around the country. I was in Europe. And I noticed that the books on Plato had dust on them. But there were books like Homeland and Philosophy or uh, The Matrix and Philosophy that were selling off the shelves. So I said, you know, maybe I could write the whole book and it would be a way to introduce bioethics to people who might otherwise be a little bit intimidated by it. You know, uh, there's a guy named John Dewey, it's famous. His, his philosophy of education is you need to start where people are interested and then introduce the more complicated issues. So Orson Black, Black is, you know, it's pretty good about the science, like 98% of the time, and it's really good about the bioethics issues. Hmm. I mean, what what are some of the other science things that the show gets right? Well, I think the science gets right that if you start with the same genotype, 
that how the result, the phenotype is going to be expressed, depends a lot on the, the surrogate, the egg that the nucleus is put into, and the circumstances that the child is raised in. So Helena is raised by a bunch of vicious nuns in the Ukraine and is really different than Allison, who's raised as a, as a kind of, you know, white bread soccer child that becomes a soccer mom. And, and that's that's pretty realistic that, you know, twin studies have showed us that. Right. I mean, the different Lita clones really almost seem as different as people could be from each other. Do you think that there's any kind of like limit on how different clones could be from each other? Uh, well, I don't think they're going to have three legs when they're ready <laughs> two. <laughs> but I think that, you know, the, the brilliance of the show is, especially with Tatiana Maslany playing them all, is to show them different, but also to have something in common at the same time. And I think it does a pretty good job of that. Uh, but the fact that Tony is trans, that's probably the limit. And there's some evidence for that, that, you know, a small difference in hormonal exposure really early could make a difference in your sexual orientation. And so how about, are there any, you said the show is 98% accurate. What is the, the, the 2% that you don't think is accurate? Well, so this is like a spoiler alert, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, a part where Olivier has a tail and a doctor at the end has that kind of like a worm-like thing in his throat. I don't think those things are accurate scientifically. And I don't think that they start getting, at the end of season three of the casters, they started to kind of lose it, I thought, about exactly why the casters were valuable and why their sexually transmitted whatever was worth studying and, you know, whether it was like a bomb or whether it was valuable, it, it really wasn't very clearly explained. It seemed to, seemed almost contradictory. Right. Because once the casters start coming into it, it feels a little bit more like a standard science fiction story where the clones are sort of creepy and affectless and have a weird bond with each other and stuff I, like I that. Agree. Yeah, especially because you get this whole thing of clones raised in pods and, you know, militaristic and sort of the unthinkingly take orders. So they're, they're, they're in some sense, they're less persons than the leaders, well, which is why I think it would be interesting in season four or season five to have a new group of clones introduced, especially someone who might be brown or black and from a developing country. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the book, you have your kind of five suggestions for where you hope Orphan Black goes. So if anyone involved in Orphan Black is listening, you should check out. There's some good ideas in there. Yeah, and actually there were 10 originally, but the you know, editor cut them down the <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, I do think having a having a sacrifice is a, would be a great way for Rachel to redeem herself. Um, yeah. yeah. You can kind of see that coming almost. But they might want to keep the character in the show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing that was really interesting, uh, and my wife kind of helped me, point me, pointed me towards this, is uh, all the studies of twins in psychology, especially at Minnesota, or the real Cosima Herder studies. And, you know, Minnesota is the study is, is the center for twin studies longitudinally, uh, both identical and non-identical, and they go to Twinsburg, Ohio every year for the twin reunion. And... Uh, just, I guess I had, before I wrote this book, I had bought a little bit into the twin mystique and the how twindom is so wonderful. And I didn't realize some of the sick stuff that occurs with parents of twins and twins themselves. It's very hard for twins to separate and become autonomous and full, full, full singletons and get away from the other twin or triplet. Right. And so you say, I mean, that the clones might have some of these same problems, not because of anything biological, but just because of the expectations that people would place onto them. The expectations are pretty powerful. I mean, the um, this one psychologist who, who was a twin, who had twins, and she only treats twins. Um, you know, I mean, there are parents that don't even call twins by different names. They call them Johnny and David together all the time and they always dress them alike and they take them out and they assume that they'll be each other's best friends for life and they go to the same college and this is bad you know parents are getting a lot of secondary gain 
uh, but it's really unhealthy for the kids. Yeah, I mean, one point in the book I thought was really interesting is you said that in a lot of ways, twins would be more similar than clones because clones, you know, would probably be raised years apart or in different environments, whereas twins have the same, for the most part, same parents, same home life, same social circle, all that kind of stuff. Same uterus, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is actually a point that Stephen Jay Gould made a long time ago. Uh, so they're they're pretty good models for both how we could create healthy people and how we could create unhealthy people. Right. But I mean, one thing that's really interesting, though, is that you talk about these identical conjoined twins um, yes. who share a body. You know, they're, they, they're basically they have two separate heads, but they share a body and that you can't really imagine any two people having shared so much genetic, both genetically and in terms of environment. But these two girls have different personalities. Well, Eng and Chang are the most famous. and. Uh... You know, one was an alcoholic and one was a non-drinker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are there are quite a few uh, conjoined twins around who uh, have different personalities. So it, it is, I think, partly you can almost see that, this might sound strange to say, but being so close for survival, you would almost have to separate as an identity just to stay sane. Uh, so it, it makes so I think something the same would happen in any group of people either raised together who are s shared exactly the same genotype. There would be some very powerful psychological stuff going on. Uh, and of course, the other thing you know that's you know it's a pretty big deal with everybody. This would be a real test of uh, nature versus nurture. And what you know what you get, and you even see this about cloning a dog. So there was a veterinarian in Louisiana who recently spent a hundred thousand dollars to clone his dog. In fact, people were like, "Oh, you're nuts! You're crazy! You shouldn't waste your money. You should give it to the homeless." And he said, "Well, I bought a Humvee, and no one criticized me, you know, and I got the money." Uh, and it, it, and he said, "You know, the dog is a lot like my old dog." So there. Right, but I, I mean, people sometimes act as if you know, if you were to clone Hitler the person would necessarily be evil. Or if you were to clone Mozart, the person would necessarily be a musical genius. And it just doesn't seem to me that it, it would work that way at all. I mean, you can easily imagine Mozart having an identical twin brother who wasn't sure. interested in music at all. And if you remove, remember the movie, uh, The Boys from Brazil, uh, Fire 11, uh, or, or the novel, one of the things they tried to do when they cloned Little Hitler was to have the exact same upbringing. So his, you know, his father died early and uh, and, and and even then it didn't work because in the end, the, one of the Hitler clones killed the the, uh, the scientist. So uh, and that per in science fiction, it seems to be often the mad scientist has to be killed in the end, like in Brothers Jurassic World or or the island or some you know. Uh, that, that's partly because it's very hard to get in science fiction a picture of a scientist who's a good guy. Right. Well, and science fiction or fiction generally, too, is constrained to often focus on things that are dramatic and make good stories. And yeah. if you just clone somebody and they're just kind of a normal person and not particularly like the person you cloned, there's not as many dramatic pers uh, possibilities there. Right. Although I think it's probably... There, there are probably other ways to make the drama, but uh, too often, um, I, and I have looked at a lot of movies about cloning, and I've read a lot of science fiction about cloning, um, and too often people just fall back on the old stuff. Uh, I mean, the number one mistake is to think that if you clone a genotype, you get some kind of memories back, you know, like in Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie, The Sixth Day. Uh, in Alien Resurrection, Ripley has some of the memory. The, the new Ripley has some of the memories of the old Rip. So that's, you know, really wrong uh, and misleading and inaccurate. Uh, but then the, the, the there, there can never, and this isn't just cloning, but there, there's hardly ever there's a scientist as well intentioned. Maybe in the day after, uh, maybe Raiders of the Lost Ark. But, uh, you know, I, I ask my students sometimes, come up with a movie where there, there's a scientist is a good guy and they, they're stumped and they're science students.
Yeah, I mean, my dad's a scientist, and he complains about that a lot. I remember we were once we were watching the old uh, War of the Worlds, and there's there's a heroic scientist in that, and and my dad says, yeah, you only get this in the really old movies, the the hero scientists. Right, because otherwise you get Doctor Frankenstein, and uh, and you know he he is rejecting his monster, and uh, so or even worse, the island of Doctor Moreau. That's that's kind of the the, the mother load, right? Or the the bad scientist. Right. Well, I mean, one of the most common treatments of cloning in science fiction is the idea that people would be cloned and then harvested for their organs. What do you yes. think about that idea? I think it's completely absurd. It's it's, um, it's just as bad as saying that uh, you could take your identical twin and kill them for their organs. I mean, as soon as it becomes a person... Uh, you know, the way you're originated doesn't affect your personhood under our laws and, and ethics. So, um, you know, it's just it's just going to be murder to do that. So I know it's a really powerful uh, idea. You see it in Greg Egan's uh, short story, The Extra, but it's just not realistic, I don't think. You could... Obviously, like killing the clone and harvesting the organs would be murder in any sort of plausible extrapolation of our current society. But you can imagine having a clone and then just sort of hoping that they would donate an organ to you if you needed it the same way a child might. Well, uh, I think a more interesting scenario uh, would be that you created a fetus and put it in some kind of artificial womb, but basically rendered it sort of like in PBS or brain dead, so it never became conscious. So you have this kind of body that's maintained, but a person never developed in it. So it's kind of like if you're moving, putting all your stuff in the mini, mini storage hmm. thing, and then just hoping, that, you know, paying to keep it around. Uh, that's a little bit more plausible, because uh, then you're not ever killing a person. But even then, I mean, technically, it's really, um, it's expensive. And it it's, it's theoretically possible. I know this because in bioethics, uh, there was a woman named Rita Green, who was a nurse, and she went in the persistent vegetative state about 1951 at Georgetown. She had good insurance, and they didn't, they made a mistake. And they've kept her body alive in a nursing home since then. So you can keep a body alive a very, very long time with the right, you know, support. I mean, what would you think about the idea of to get around the cost of having to keep this uh, brain dead body alive all this time to sort of put like a pig brain or a cow brain or something into a human body? And then it could kind of like feed itself and stay alive. And then you could still harvest its organs. Uh, That's actually something that you know, the cloning with mammals is kind of working on. Like at the Roslon Institute, uh, they clone five little piggies who they hope would go to market. Uh, <laughs> but basically a xenotransplant, hoping that uh, they could grow their organs. Uh, and uh, the, the problem with a lot of that is that when you do the, the transplant, this just happened with the face transplant up in the, I think it was Pittsburgh, uh, you have to give them the very powerful immunosuppressant drugs, which tend to give you cancer over the long run, if you only give a small dose of the immunosuppressive drugs like they did in the face transplant, well, the face just sloughed off. It was rejected. So there's a real balance between getting those organs accepted you know, versus rejected. And then if the, the more powerful anti-rejection drugs you get, then you start getting 10 years, everybody starts getting cancer. So I haven't really got past that problem yet. Kind of like having an artificial womb. We haven't really been working on that for a long, long time and still haven't got it. Huh. And the tissue being rejected, that that's still a problem even if the tissue is coming from a clone of yourself? No, no. You said you were talking about pigs and other animals. No, but I was like, saying if I were to clone my human body, but have it have a pig brain inside the human body. A pig brain inside, but then the brain would be the from the pig. Right. Not, yeah. 
but then the brain would probably be rejected by the body. That's the problem. Yeah. I mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, even a pig valve has to be pretty carefully disguised. Uh, the um, yeah, it's hard to you know. There's there in the book I talk about boundary crossings, and uh, I think evolution has set up a lot of warning checkpoints. So like in embryonic development, if there's some kind of major chromosomal abnormality, half of those those embryos don't make it. They're kind of like, you know, deleted. So our our bodies are kind of set up to reject foreign stuff. So that's the problem. Yeah, but on the other hand, if you were an identical twin, you can put the first kidney transplant came between identical twins. Huh. Well, I mean, this is why I was kind of wondering if, if, if I were to clone myself and then my clone were to clone itself, could the could my clone give me uh, organs when I get old and need them? And then its clone could give it organs when it gets old and needs it. And it would be kind of like Social Security where the young people are paying forward to the old people. Sure. And you could also be, though, like uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist who um, had a daughter to follow in him, and she became a Christian fundamentalist. <laughs> and um so you know LeBron James's son might decide to be an orthodox rabbi. Uh those people are going to have free will and people sometimes, you know, it's the whole stereotype of the Baptist uh, minister's daughter, right, who's like the wild child. So you just don't know that things are going to fall into place. The, the I mean, let's face it, many many a parent uh their kids have not sort of done what they expected. (laughs) Hopefully uh, your child would love you so much that he or she would want to give you like one of his kidneys or part of his lung. Uh, That would be the ideal, I think. But I think somebody might justifiably, and this is, this is pretty real. I mean, I, I've had, you know, parents, as a parent says to a kid, I had I had you because I wanted somebody to take care of me in old, my old age. The kid might feel a little chafed at that, you know? Mm-hmm. But I mean, you, you do mention examples in the book like Archie Manning, who raised both his sons to be NFL quarterbacks. Yep. Yep. And did a pretty good job, too, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but, there, you know, for every Archie Manning, uh, there's probably 100 that failed. That we don't hear about. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is probably one of the major. It is the major objection about cloning that the parents would put such powerful expectations on the kid that he would have a closed future, uh, and that uh, you know he really they would be so disappointed if he didn't become a quarterback that uh, he would feel like a failure, and that's. That's a lot to put on a kid, right? But is that a, it's, it's that seems like sort of a weird double standard, though? Because I mean, like, yeah, you have people like Archie Manning who raise his kids to be quarterbacks, or you have a lot of parents who are religious and homeschool their kids so that they never have any outside influences yes. at all, right? And it seems like if you had just somebody who cloned himself and then didn't put any particular expectations on his kid, it's hard for me to see why one is so controlling and narcissistic than the other one isn't. Oh, I agree. I think homeschooling is incredibly controlling and narcissistic. Uh, and the way you described it just now, I think that's absolutely right. If you just kind of left it open, then I don't think there's any problem with that at all. Uh, I have much more problem with homeschooling, especially uh, the kids I see that are homeschooled. They're terrible in science because they can't. The parents can't afford the expensive science labs, and they're also not very well, very, very socialized. Right. But I mean, so it seems like, though, if you were to clone, if you're going to clone like a a celebrity, like you mentioned, LeBron James or something, it seems like if you were to clone a beautiful actress, you're almost certainly going to get a beautiful daughter. And if you clone a big, strong athlete, you're almost certainly going to get a big, strong son. But anything more nebulous, like artistic talent or leadership or things like that, you have a very small chance of ending up with those qualities just because you cloned a particular person. Right. And so even. Even though, like, you clone, like, Taylor Swift, uh, probably some of the qualities we associate with her are 
Well, you know, first of all, they're multifactorial. And so genes have, I'm sure you know, a range of expression that's basically based partly on epigenetics and what happens in the environment. And how those things uniquely come together is pretty arbitrary. And uh, so it's conceivable that you could clone five versions of Taylor Swift and none of them sang quite like her, but more importantly, none of them had her drive and ambition and, and skills in terms of business and you know, self-marketing and clothes. So some of the things we associate with Taylor Swift are probably not just due to the base genetic package, but a whole bunch of other things. And we would, you know, that's that nature nurture question we're going to have to find out about again. Um, I mean, you'd have a good shot at it, but you probably wouldn't get a superstar. Yeah. I mean, one thing you raised in the book I thought was really interesting was this idea that if lots of people are, say, having daughters who are clones of Taylor Swift, then if there's a murder or something and you had their Taylor Swift's blood is the killer, how do you know which of the 500 or 1,000 Taylor Swift clones walking around committed the crime? Yeah. And that's also a possible plot in Orphan Black, right? Because there's a crime. How do you know which one did it? And I, and there have been real cases. There was a case in Malaysia where they couldn't decide, prove which twin did it, so they both got off, or the real the, the real criminal got off. Uh, and the more that were around, yeah. I mean, another interesting issue about cloning that is what if somebody, uh, you know, somehow scratched Taylor Swift or Brad Pitt and got, you know, live cells underneath their fingernails. I mean, do you need someone's permission to clone their genotype? Right now, you don't really own your genotype. It seems like ethically you would need somebody's permission, to me, uh, but legally you don't, really. I mean, so how do you actually think this is going to play out? I mean, do you think people will be cloning themselves or celebrities? And on what time frame do you think that'll be happening? I think that the Pacific Rim countries think that um, America is kind of hung up with its pur puritanical past. Uh, you know, Leon Cass and the, the, the Republicans and the Vatican are very backwards looking about cloning whereas in, in Asia they're much they have a very different attitude especially in terms of the Confucianism and ancestor worship so there's a, there's a strange sense in which cloning an ancestor resonates much more favorably in Asia than it does in North America or Europe so and also places like um, Singapore uh, and South Korea have put billions of dollars into biotech, uh, not just for cloning, but for stem cells uh, and GM food. And I think they see this as an opportunity to leap ahead in biotech. So I expect it to happen over there. And I also expect it to happen, as I wrote in one of the chapters of the book, in a family that's interested in perpetuating its resources you know, almost creating a kind of biological dynasty. And I think it'll have to be very quiet about doing it because people will freak out, you know, otherwise. <laughs> but, then I, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, as the IVF baby taught us, and no one will know if a family, uh, you know, if their grandchildren clone, you know, Uncle Tom, who was – a great billionaire and a really great businessman, no one will know. It'll just, he'll just look like a normal baby. Right. And, and so the one possibility you raise in the book is that basically normal people wouldn't be able to compete with people with these superior cloned genomes. Do you, do you expect that to happen, that these people will take over the world? I don't know about the taking over the world, but they would... I mean, there's a, we already know that there's 1% of the world that has about 50% of the wealth, right? And uh, we know they're very powerful families. And, I mean, even without cloning, one of the great sources of inequality in the world is the family, because the family will back its own, uh, you know, not just in education, but also in starting businesses. And I mean, look at Donald Trump, how much, how much ahead he got from his father. So if you add what's already occurring – 
to a much richer biological base, it is certainly true that what some people call the gen rich will have a lot of advantages in the world. And uh, you can, if you extrapolate that for 200 years, uh, it does seem that maybe, you know, one 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 hundredth of one percent will own seventy five percent of the wealth. Uh, on the other hand, they may invent things that we all really like, like Facebook hmm. and iPhone. So, you know, but I, I do think that could happen inside a family dynasty, especially in um, in places like Japan and, and India, where where families control very much who their children mate with. Right. Well, well, speaking of iPhones, I mean, you know, what happens, the pattern we see with a lot of technology is it starts out where only the wealthy can afford it, but then the price comes down to the point where, you know, most people like on the subway say have an iPhone, but then there's other technology like yachts where the price never really comes down. Do you think that this like cloning of children, will this be something that it comes down to the point where anyone who wants to can afford it or will it always be really expensive and hard to do? You know, it's, Probably the uh, in vitro fertilization is probably the best model, uh, and uh, we're all kind of agonizing about how much IVF should be subsidized by our group plans. Uh, uh, in the first couple of decades, you had to basically put it on your credit card or take out a second mortgage to pay for IVF, and now about 20 states cover it. Uh, so the price has come down as more people uh, use it. Uh, but it's still about eight thousand dollars a try for IVF. Um, so yeah, the price will probably come down. I, I doubt if <laughs> anyone is going to say that you know the right to clone a genotype is should be covered by group insurance, though. Right, right. I mean, do do you see any sort of future where cloning or genetic at any at any rate genetically engineered children are the norm and like only sort of weird Luddite types still have children without any kind of technological assistance? Well, I mean, the thing that drops out for a lot of people don't realize is that you have to use IVF right now to use cloning, right? Because you have to have that that nucleus in an egg outside the womb in order to put the nucleus from the old genotype in the egg and then make an embryo and put it back in. So that you have to use assisted reproduction, and that's expensive, and it only works about a third of the time. So that's a pretty big practical barrier. Uh, on the other hand, there is a new thing called CRISPR that's shaking up the world, and that is pretty revolutionary. Um, I don't know if you've heard about CRISPR. Well, I, I read about it in your book, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, Probably the, uh, I think Science Magazine called it the breakthrough of the year last year. Uh, I was talking to my nephew this weekend who's going off to Cambridge in a biotech program. And it's the kind of thing where a really smart kid like him could change the genes and germline of like a mouse and make that all that mouse's progeny kind of glow orange in the dark, you know, from then on. And it ain't that hard to do. So that kind of stuff with cloning is really powerful. And I, that's a little bit exciting, but also a little bit scary because, you know, I, I don't see how you control that. Right. And is there any reason in principle that he couldn't do that with humans? Well, you'd have to get a human to agree to it. Uh, and it could be done maybe surreptitiously. Chris, it's conceivable that something like CRISPR or cloning could be used in a assisted reproduction clinic, and no one would even know. So, that's that's kind of interesting. Right. I mean, the the scenario that comes to mind for me is if you had some weird religious cult, and they would use something like CRISPR to make sure their daughters were more submissive or obedient or something, you know, to genetically ensure that. Is that a possibility? Well, it's certainly a possibility in uh, uh, Orphan Black. I mean. Or Enric would certainly like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you know, there, there was speculation, I don't know, a couple of years back that there was a God gene. Do you remember this? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. That, uh, you know, there's also speculation of the gay gene. And so choice is choice. I mean, if there were such a thing, you know, gay couples might choose 
to put, you know, a gay gene in their the, the embryo that their surrogate was going to gestate, and religious people might choose to have the the God gene. And uh, choice is choice. I guess you know, uh, one of the problems of people like me who are pro-choice is if you open that door, you have to sort of let people choose whatever they want. Uh, but I, I suspect a lot of these things are going to be, you know, multifactorial and depend on the inputs, you know, the range of expression. So we'll just have to see how it all works out. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it's, this is something that's going to happen on a long time frame. But I just think about, I mean, they have dogs that are bred to want to herd sheep and things like that. I mean, it seems like there's very specific behaviors you can encode genetically in, in organisms. It certainly does. I mean, people want a yellow lab because they're or a golden retriever because they have a very specific uh, disposition. Although, God forbid, you should ever generalize from a dog's disposition to a human. Hmm. Or <laughs> People will, you know, think you're a complete nut. But we do know that some some people tend to be depressive and some people tend to be optimistic. Uh, you know, cho- choice has been around a lot less than we think. I mean, my kids are always surprised when I find out that before 1962, it was illegal for a doctor to prescribe birth control. And uh, so we haven't really gotten used to the idea of people having choice about whether to have a baby and especially about the traits of a baby. And it's a pretty scary thing, I think, for most people, the idea that, you know, couples would have choice. You know, that's the Gattaca syndrome, right? Right, but I I think, like, I think people have sort of an irrational attachment to what's familiar and Sure, sure. I don't know if it's irrational, but you know, it's it it feels right. Yeah. But I mean I think people see the downsides of something new in a way they don't see the downsides of something familiar. Absolutely, and... because random random genetic mix also brings you random disability and dysfunction too. Right. I was actually thinking about that reading your book. I don't know if you ever uh, read this story by Barry Longyear called Enemy Mine, where there's an alien. It's a hermaphroditic alien that re- reproduces asexually. And I was just imagining in a society of these aliens, if scientists came along and they introduced the new concept of sexual reproduction, these aliens would freak <laughs> out, right? It would... Yes. Yes. Very good point. They would freak out. Absolutely. Because it would be new and heterodox. Right. And they would say exactly what you're saying, right? You're going to have a kid and you have no idea what the kid is going to be like. It's just you're you're leaving it completely up to chance. The kid could have serial killer genes for all you know. Yes. I mean, the most common genetic defect in Caucasians is cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. I mean, that that would seem to be madness to deliberately allow that to be randomly introduced when you could, when you could prevent it. In fact, it would almost be a definition of a bad parent, you know, because you want the best for your kids, right? Of course. Yeah, no, uh, certainly. But the thing I was going to say is that, um, you know, people think that there are these huge dangers to genetically engineering human beings, but there are also these huge dangers to leaving human beings the way we are, because, I mean, we're destroying the planet, you know, it just seems like a matter of time before someone sets off a nuclear bomb, etc. And it might be that the only hope for humanity is to genetically engineer people to be less selfish and less aggressive. Right, or to be able to... um sleep a long time for a space journey uh, and not, you know, damage their brains. Uh, th- that's very true. I mean, especially as the planet seems to start getting at the tipping point in terms of numbers and climate change, uh, we may need to figure out some ways like an interstellar to escape, you know, have some, uh, at least some people, you know, can possibly leave uh, and carry on the genes. Right. And so, I mean, I feel like I'm more comfortable with these possibilities because I grew up reading science fiction and I'm used to thinking these sorts of things. But like like you said at the beginning, like most people just totally flip out if they if you mention anything like this. Um, Do you think that do you think there's anything to be done about that? I mean, how do you how do you get along with uh, other bioethicists? Uh, Do they think that? Well, I I think uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I (laughs) will. The easy road in bioethics is to be an alarmist and to say, you know, the technology is changing faster than our wisdom and just to say no all the time. Um, It's much harder to say yes. You know, looking back in 1978, almost everybody in bioethics should have said yes to assisted reproduction. It's pro-life. Parents want the kids. 
but it's hard to to be out there because if something goes wrong, then you know you're you know you're you feel responsible. Um, and, and science fiction has uh, it's a double edged sword because uh, as you say, a lot of science fiction to be dramatic has to scare us. So it's done its share of scaring people about science and choice, uh, as, a, as well as you know, the good science fiction, which has laid out a more optimistic future. Um, so you got to, you know, uh, I'm optimistic that I, I think a tool is a tool is a tool. We should never destroy a tool, and that whether the tool is used rightly depends on the motives of the people. You know, you can use a hammer to kill somebody or a habitat for humanity. Um, and I, I think cloning, reproductive cloning, I mean, look at Cuba. They have a, a wonderful, huge a dairy cow that's like a prize cow that produces like 800 times more milk than a normal cow, and they've cloned it, and it's doing great. Uh, that seems to me a perfectly legitimate use of the technology. In this country, we are so afraid of the C word, we can't sell cloned flesh or cloned milk because um, it's cloned, you know? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how do, how do you think that you ended up with such a different outlook from so many other bioethicists? I mean, is there anything in your intellectual development or your past that you think pointed you in this direction? I think seeing... So I, I wrote a textbook uh, that's used a lot in medical ethics where... It focuses on classic cases like Karen Quinlan and the first baby Louise Brown and just kind of living through all the craziness that occurred on assisted reproduction. And by the way, it wasn't just the first test tube baby. It also occurred when the first woman used a younger egg, uh, when, when, when surrogate mothers came along, uh, when elder, elderly people started gestating babies for like their daughters. I mean, almost every innovation in reproduction was met with some kind of huge outcry. Uh, you remember the, the advertisement in the Princeton newspaper for uh, a girl with a high SAT to be an egg donor? I mean, people just thought that you know, the world was coming to an end over that. So, and, and almost all these things are tempest in a teapot. You know, they're really not a really big deal. Uh, one of the things that people don't really realize uh, I think I might make an okay point in the book is regression to the mean in population genetics. So if you have 7 billion people on earth, even if you were trying to create a race of eight foot footers, it would be almost impossible to do that unless you can control everybody's reproduction, which is also almost impossible to control because people will made anywhere. Right? So, there's very little danger of the gene pool going down, and it's also really hard to move it up in mass. Well, right, but I think that assumes a free society, right? And, I mean, you can imagine in, like, North Korea or, you know, under Saddam Hussein or something, all sorts of, you know, things that things might happen that, that, that wouldn't happen in a free society. Well, it would have to be a really, really, really unfree society because, I mean, you're basically talking about controlling every possible instance where a man and woman could have sex. Every possible instance. And that's a lot of control, you know? That is a lot of control. Because people have a way of slipping out together, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. But, I mean, you could have a, a population of eight-foot-tall soldiers and control who they mated with, right? And you could control it if they could only reproduce through assisted reproduction. But even then, at a certain point, are you ever going to let them mate with anybody else? That's the problem, right? So you could you could create 50, 100, 5,000, but to make 7 billion people, you've got to get it out into the general population, and then it starts getting watered down immediately. It's like having trying to have everybody blue-eyed, right? It's probably going to be diluted really quickly. But on a family dynasty is a whole different thing because they could keep it in the family and maybe control it in a very different way. And there are Asian and Indian families that have an extraordinary amount of control who their, who their kids mate with. They often mate in terms of caste and subcaste, and they really do control you know, the, the marriages that way. 
which also includes the children. Right. So do you see the United States really falling behind other countries because of our more reluctant attitudes to embrace some of this technology? Yes, I do. I mean, right now, um, I gave a talk recently over at Georgia State on latest things in stem cells, and I went to talk to one of our researchers here. And Birmingham is a major medical center. We've got some amazing things going on here. Uh, we basically cured sickle cell in a mouse, and we are ready to try it on a human being. But the FDA and the NIH have become kind of paralyzed with fear that something bad might happen with stem cells or gene therapy. And they basically want assurances that nothing bad will happen. You know, it's called the precautionary principle. That is impossible to give, you know, proof that nothing bad will ever happen in a new human experiment. And I think the in in Asia they have a completely different attitude. For example, in Japan, they now have given stem cell treatments a seven year exemption from normal regulation. So they can try all kinds of new stuff. I think that's very you know, this is for people who are desperate. You know, might be paralyzed or have cancer, and they can try a stem cell at the treatment. They have to pay for it at their own risk. I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it, it's it's the way to go. Well, right. Like this part of your book really struck me as you said that what we all really want is not to be able to clone people necessarily, but to use cells from our bodies to reverse aging, heal severed spinal cords, and inject new neural cells into aging brains. It would be a biological Lazarus capable of staving off death for decades, if not raising the dead, and we are getting oh so close. And it's my own stuff, right? It's your own stuff. If you create an embryo, you know, clone an embryo of you, and I mean, I know that people object to talking this way, but it is kind of your stuff. Some people want to say an embryo is a person. I don't agree with that. Uh, but I do think uh, it could be um, your stuff. And in, in the history of medicine, um, not only stem cells, but induced pluripotent cells are kind of like one of the, the greatest discoveries in the last couple hundred years. And, you know, the whole thing with George W. Bush when he shut it down uh, was a tragedy, you know, because the NIH is the treasury of the world in terms of funding science. And the fact that we just shut all that down for decades is just awful. Um, and, yeah, we could have our own stuff regenerate us you know, our brains, our hearts, and we just haven't really made any progress. And there's a lot of hype. And now people have to go to these offshore, you know, clinics in Mexico or um, Ukraine. And unfortunately, you know, this is the dark side of stem cells. So, people, you know, there's always going to be hustlers that prey on people and uh, they don't do any kind of clinical trials. They don't report any results. Uh, so they don't really know if any of it's working. Uh, but yes, I think the, the Asian Pacific Rim is poised to leave us behind. And as soon as they get some kind of success, you know, we're all going to be paying to go over there and get it. And we will, too, because, you know, if your granddad's starting to shed his neurons early onset Alzheimer's and there's a chance you can reverse it or at least stabilize it, you're going to go get it. Yeah. Yeah, well, God, this is so fascinating, and unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so do you, do you have any just uh, final words or any other projects you want to mention or anything like that? Um, the only other thing I want to say is that the stuff about eugenics and orphan black, I talk about people think it only happened over Nazis. It's not true. It happened in America, and I, I didn't realize how much it happened in Canada. Uh, there has been some really bad eugenic stuff that happened in this country, and Orphan Black gets it right. All right, great. Yeah, and you can read a lot more about that in Gregory Pence's book, What We Talk About When We Talk About Clone Club, Bioethics, and Philosophy in Orphan Black. So, Gregory, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been very enjoyable. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Gregory Pence for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Dahlius in the UK, who writes, Blimey, this is the good stuff. I've been listening to Geek's Guide to the Galaxy for two weeks now, working my way through back episodes as well as keeping up to date. Mostly in the car, and it's been a trip, man. Tremendous stuff, smart without added condescension. Liking the panel discussions in particular, 
These have been insightful and fun, with added seriousness when required. Standout moments? Weird Westerns and Mad Max Fury Road panel review. Everything else is most excellent. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy provides affirmation for you geeks everywhere. And for those geeks still to come out, it may be the encouragement you need. P.S. Any chance you could have a wee chat with the Sci-Fi Channel with regards to releasing The Expanse over here in Britain? Cheers. So big thanks again to Dalius for that great review. Special thanks as well to Bill Martini, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.